and East Plans Panel. My name is Councillor Javed Akhtar and I will be chairing today's meeting. Could I remind everyone that today's meeting is being live streamed on the Leeds City Council YouTube channel so that the public can observe the meeting without needing to be present. North and East Plans Panel deals with op applications from the North, East and the East of the city. The aim of the panel is to hear all the relevant information from applicants, members of public and the council officers to help members of the panel to make their decision. Could I now invite members and officers to introduce, introduce themselves and mute your microphone once you have introduced yourself. If I start from the left. Thank, thank you, Chair. My name is Glenn Allen. I'm Principal Planning Officer uh, dealing with the first substantive item on the agenda today. Uh, David Jones, team leader for the East team. Uh, Lisa Brannan, Principal Engineer Highways. John Stonard, Team Leader for Design and Projects, um, advising on the first substantive item. Good afternoon, everyone. Nicole Sharp, Temple News and Ward. Good, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Councillor David Jenkins, and I represent Killingbeck and Seacroft. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ray Jones. I'm a councillor for Horsworth. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Miller. I'm a councillor for uh, Kipax and Methley Ward. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Councillor Jim McKenna, and I represent the Yarmley Ward. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Councillor Jules Hesselwood representing Wheatwood Ward. Good afternoon, Sarah Holmes. I'm part of the PANS panel team. Councillor Barry Anderson, Adeline Wharfdale Ward. Hi, everyone. Natasha Prosser and Clark to the meeting. Pippa Plumtree Varley, Principal Legal Officer and Legal Advisor to the panel this afternoon. Good afternoon, Jonathan Carr, Head of Development Management. Good afternoon, David Newbury, Lead Planning Officer for the Plans Panel. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, moving on to agenda, can I ask the clerk to go through uh, item one to five, please? Thanks, Chair. Agenda item one, there's no appeals. Agenda item two, there's no exempt items. Agenda item three, no formal late items. Agenda item four, can members declare any interests? Thank you. And then agenda item five, apologies from Councillor Stevenson today, and we don't have a substitute for him. And then over to you, Chair. Thank you. Item six, minutes of the previous meeting held on the 1st of June 2023. Do member accept these minutes are a true and correct record? I'll assume correct unless indicated otherwise. Are members happy to move these? Yeah, thank you. Are there any materializing? Thank you. <laughs> item seven, uh, could I ask the officers to introduce uh, item seven, please? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, th this item is regarding two actual applications that are in at the moment, uh, both reserve matters applications. Um, relating to two uh, parts of the um, East Leeds extension. They are um, a, a reserve matters application for residential development made by Taylor Wimpy and a reserve matters application made by an applicant called Cullen Land. The, the report is presented as a position statement. So uh, officers are not seeking to make a recommendation um, on the contents of the report at the moment. And members will note from having looked at the papers that there's a series, short series of questions throughout the report and repeated at the end um, to facilitate discussion on the various issues that, that are raised through the, uh, the, the processing of this application. The, the, the purpose of seeking the position statement is to facilitate with the um, ongoing negotiations with the developer in order to hopefully um, accelerate um, the, the final determination of these applications and uh, moving them forward. Uh, Chair, through you, I've just got some updates uh, since the writing of the report. Um, we have received six letters from individuals, three each for representing each reserve matter application. So that's three letters each application. Um, and these letters are seeking um, a desire to see the use of swift bricks 
installed in each of the houses. Uh, for the uninitiated, these are hollow bricks with small holes in them to allow swifts and other small birds to nest. Um, so this request is drawn to members' attention as it doesn't uh, form part of the actual development at the moment. Um, this uh, request has also been drawn to our attention by Councillor Gibson um, uh, as part of representations that he's made also. Other representations uh, received from Councillor Lennox and Councillor Gibson have both expressed opinions regarding the mix of dwellings, um, and I'll refer members to uh, question two in the report uh, in with regards to this particular item. In summary, they consider that the affordable houses should be better represented in the larger housing size, that's three or four bedroom properties. Councillor Gibson has highlighted that he has been contacted primarily by families containing five to six members who are living in two bedroom properties in support of the, the representation he's making. Uh, Councillor Gibson also draws attention to the aims and objectives of becoming a Marmot city and that this development sits behind Swarcliff, which falls within the 10% most deprived neighbourhoods of Leeds, and it should provide a clear opportunity to support that existing community to develop their economic, social and cultural resources. He requests that the Marmot city team be involved with and make recommendations to this development, i.e. that they are consulted. Councillor Lennox's uh, comments are that it's a shame to see that the majority of the proposed affordable houses are two bedrooms when we know that in our part of the city, families need housing with an appropriate number of bedrooms for their children, meaning three or more. I would hope to see more three bedroom homes included in the number of affordable units. She also expresses concern that there is no indication of the number of socially rented units to be included in this development given the high number of bids received in the Sawcliffe Windmore area. However, officers have explained that the split of uh, socially rented units will be defined by the conditions attached to the original outline permission and the contents of Section, one, Section 106 agreements attached to the approval of that outline, and that the policy requirement for the 40-60 split in the provision of social housing will be met through that process rather than through these reserve matters applications. <clears throat> so, turning attention to the uh, contents of the report, C can we move the slides on, please? The remote doesn't seem to be working. Ah, thank you. The, the, this is the, um, the, the the layout that is contained in the reserve matters applications. It, it, it's a single layout for the two reserve matters. The um, just by way of explanation, the the north point is actually facing to the left of the screen as, as you are looking at it. Uh, I've had it orientated through 90 degrees simply so that the whole scheme can be seen in the landscape format rather than if we put in portrait, it would be very small indeed. Um, not that it's not already small in that scheme. So south is to the right-hand side of the screen and north is to the left-hand side of the screen, just, just so that you can get your orientation in, in terms of that res respect. Uh, the, the Taylor Wimpley application is for 250 dwellings and the Cullen land site proposes 44 dwellings, given a combined total of circa 294. There's a mix of housing and flats proposed to be provided in two different character areas. The southern section of the site adopts a more contemporary design approach for the housing with larger format windows, no head sill de or sill details to give a modern appearance and including the use of brick and render splits and flat roof canopies over front doors. The second character area in the northern section of the site is more traditional, includes the use of heads and sills and greater focus on single use of brick, pitched roof canopies over front doors and more symmetrical window sizes. Um, <clears throat> Detailed work went into the master plan as part of the outline for the middle quadrant, and as such, relatively detailed proposals were advanced at that stage. Key components of the outline master plan included the position of the, site of the spine road, which was to be tree-lined, tree and the establishment of which actually sort of defines the areas that are ca capable of development. Um, the retention of the woodland area to the west of the former sorry, to the west end of the former Leeds to Weatherby railway line, and in delivering good east to west links, including the need 
to integrate with the new bridge crossing of Relaw, which is the bridge we stood on uh, this morning at the site visit, and, and also existing crossings over Cockbeck. Um, the, the detailed proposals for both reserve matters applications very closely followed the guiding principles as set out in the outline master plan and SPD. The proposals include the provision of 45, 45 affordable houses, 15.3%, and compliance with the nationally described space standards is achieved for all house types, with the exception of one house type, which accounts for five units in total. In terms of accessibility, uh, accessible housing, 256 dwellings are identified to be M42 compliant, and which equates to 90.1%, and 26 would be M43 compliant, which equates to 8.8%. So turning to the matters that um, form part of the reserve matters, looking at layout, appearance and scale. Th this slide shows a, a general approach to the, um, the design and the external appearance of the various house types and the flatted development and is presented for, for, for members um, viewing and consideration. Um, as you can see, the details on there are um, as described in, in my introduction. And this slide seeks to show what the general street scenes across the estate would, would appear like, um, assuming planning permission eventually is granted. So in respect to um, layout appearance and scale, um, I don't necessarily want to go and repeat everything that I've said in the instruction, and hopefully the two slides that I've just shown you will be uh, informative with you for you. But officers are just still in dis in discussions with the applicants, ironing out relatively minor issues identified in the layout and details of, of detailed matters of design. Um, and in respect to this, I would draw to members' attention. Uh, question one, which we'll get to uh, at the end, is do members have any comments in respect of the layout and appearance of the dwellings, including the concept of two different character areas? In respect of housing mix, this is specifically conditioned as part of the outline approval, and a housing mix report has been submitted that seeks to justify a strong demand for family properties against a high provision of two and three bed properties already in the area. The figures rep reproduced in the report of paragraph 48 show that if the one and two bed properties are considered together, then the targets are met and the report goes into more detail in order to justify this approach. A member's attention is drawn to question two in this respect. Turning to affordable housing and the issue raised already raised by the board members, 45 units are provided across the two application sites, which meets the policy H5 requirements in terms of percentage. Local ward members have already reported have raised concerns that larger properties should be included in the affordable housing provision against the applicant stance that there is need for smaller affordable units across the market more generally. Offers have already, however, raised this with the applicants and are in discussions with them to seek to improve the mix of affordable housing that is currently on offer. A member's attention is drawn to question three in this regard. In respect of houses for independent living, this is exceeded in terms of the levels to be provided on the submitted drawings. In respect of minimum space standards, as I've already made reference, five units do not appear to meet the internal space standards as set out in policy H9, and officers are in discussion with the applicants regarding this. In simple terms, the message given to the applicants is that there's no excuse not to meet or exceed these standards for all the properties in the development, given it's a pretty much a greenfield site. A member's attention is drawn to question four in this regard. Landscaping. The landscaping master plan submitted seeks to protect the existing main woodland situated between the disused railway and Cockbeck. Additionally, a linear landscape wildlife corridor running along the western boundary and adjacent to Cockbeck is proposed and would link into similar proposals submitted as part of the adjoining uh, residential development to the north. Also included within the wider landscape proposals is provision for three SUDS attenuation basins, 
which will be which will include wetland, meadow mix planting, and aquatic marginal planting. Tree planting is indicated along the entirety of the spine road, and some is shown on the roads off the spine road. Connections in an east-west direction is shown with connections to the Stanks estate to the west. And there are eight um, in total local play areas um, indicated on the layout across the site. I have um, some pictures provided by the developers in terms of the, the provision of the suds, just for members' information. They obviously are uh, artistic impressions, but the idea, uh, the assurances that we've had is that they are to be permanently wet uh, in terms of the provision so that they don't dry up during uh, the, the summer season, except it, obviously in times of severe drought. But ordinarily, the idea is that there would be a feature uh, as presented in the slides um, before members now. Um, a pump station is indicated and overlooked by plots, is indicated at and overlooked by plots 127 and 128 on the layout. And officers have raised concerns in terms of amen amenity impact that this will have, and additional information is awaited from the applicants in regards to this. Again, members' attention is drawn to question five in regards to landscaping. Um, one aspect of the layout that has been discussed with developers is the provision of Copenhagen style crossings and the developers uh, have helpfully provided examples of these to show members. Um, so that, that's just another example of, of SUDS provision for members' attention. Um, but the Copenhagen uh, style crossings, there are several examples that the applicants have provided us with examples of, uh, and these are to be provided through the um, through the site layout in order to facilitate um, and improve on uh, pedestrian um, safety. Um, I've now got a, a short series of photographs, uh, hopefully will be particularly useful for those members who couldn't make it for the site visit this morning. Um, th this is the site from the southern boundary on Leeds Road looking north, and as members can see, basically just a, an open field. Um, this is the southern side boundary with Leeds Road shown prominently on the right hand side there going up to the junction of Leeds Road with Elaw. So that, that's the southern boundary of the site and where the access to the site will actually be taken from uh, into the Spine Road. And then at the footbridge, which already goes across the um, Elaw Road, I've taken a series of photographs. Um, this one faces pretty much due south and members can see the cycleway in there and the fields beyond the fence and obviously to the right, top right hand part of that picture is the application site facing south. The, the trees in the distance form part of the um, existing treed area that is up for protection as part of the master plan for the landscaping proposals. And if you imagine turning clockwise, heading towards north, this, this is a selection of photographs from that central point. Um, th th that, that's the belt of trees that goes across part of the site to provide the, the footpath length through from the Stanks estate and also from the existing footpath that runs on the, the far side of the application site. And then we're starting to head looking north uh, over the fields to the north um, with um, leads in the background there. Um, until we get to the the final slide, which, as you can see, is facing almost due north with the road on the right hand side and the, the the northern boundary of the side being pretty much the the top edge of the field that can be seen in that photo. So it is on that basis that we um, commend to the off, uh, to the members the questions that are reproduced at the end of the report. Um, and to open this up for discussion. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you. Uh, in accordance with our protocol for public speak uh, speaking at the plans panel, uh, I understand we have a couple of speakers, a uh, local ward member, Councillor Pauline Graham, and the uh, agent, Mark Johnson. So if you can come to the uh, top table, please. Uh, and both of you have four minutes each uh, to address to the panel so when you're ready.
Yeah, just for the uh, information to the members, the reason I've given eight minutes to both speakers, normally we divide four minutes between numbers of speakers because there are two applications on this before us. So each application can have up to four minutes. Thank you, Chair. I don't think I'll be needing eight minutes. So just <laughs> I want to obviously be here. Um, I chair the consultative forum that's been since 2012 we've had and we've worked very well with the developers and the residents come and the, the concerns from the forum are about the size of the affordable properties and support of Council Lennox's comments and also the retention of the green areas so um, I think that's really it but the thing the affordable properties are our main issue and also when you go into the new developments, you can always pick them out because they are different, smaller, and lumped together. So um, it's the size of the properties and retention of the green areas. Okay. Th th thank, thank you, uh, Councillor Graham. Any questions uh, to Councillor Graham's? Mr. Sharp. Thanks, Chair. Uh, just in terms of um, housing mix, um, I mean, as you know, I, I work in the constituency office, so I see daily the casework that comes in. In terms of housing mix, um, I've never, uh, we've never had casework where somebody has said um, they want a two bedroom. It's more often than not a three bedroom or a four bedroom. There's a lot of big families, as you know, you know, you've, you've lived around there for years yourself. Um, so do you? Do you think that there needs to be more uh, larger homes in the housing mix? Yes, councillor. <clears throat> I've forgotten your name. There. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I did say that, and it is the size, yes, because obviously a two-bedroom property is okay for people who have downsized. Years ago, that used to be it. Families who've grown up and the parents are on their own or elderly people. But it's definitely the size. And that's the thing we've said right from the beginning regarding the size of the properties. Thank you, uh, Councillor Hazelwood. Um, yeah, it's it's on the um, it's on the affordable mix of two bed and three bed, um, as you've said, because um, that all our casework comes in, it's people asking for three bed houses, even if it's a family of four. Uh, and you've got a boy and a girl, you need a three bed house. It's not just larger families. So we get a lot, uh, absolutely as councillors across the city, we get a lot of requests for this. So I'm just looking at the report, um, the affordable mix, which is only 45 houses out of the full development, there's 33 two bed and uh, an, an eight three bed. So basically, I was basically saying we want that reversed or is there a, is there a figure that you're looking for? Well, Really, we'd like them all to be three bedrooms, but um, we definitely want more larger properties, the bedrooms, and I can't see any reason why not. And it's an area that's been green space for years, so they've got permission to do that. So it should be done to meet the needs of the public and everybody else, but we definitely need larger properties. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? No, thank you very much, Councillor Graham. Uh, can can we now ask Mr. 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 Johnson, please, uh, and his team? Right. When you're ready, you got four minutes to address. Buttons it. There we go. Sorry, just to clarify, Chair, it's eight minutes. Um, yes, um, and, and and obviously, you know, we've been here many times before, not just with this particular application through the outline, but I think members will remember us most recently as the same team that was here on the Swinnow Park Weatherby scheme, which recently got the detailed approval. And I think what we like to say is that we're carrying those good design points from Weatherby over into this particular scheme. And we've worked very, very closely with the council. And just to remind everybody is that the middle quadrant is part of East Leeds extension and e law. And what we're to some extent bound by is the policies, the section 106, the community infrastructure levy, 
And then also the roof tax, um, and just as a reminder, that goes with the development, the roof tax in effect is applied to every property. And in this particular case for the middle quadrant, something in the order of £22,000 per plot is paid back to the council in order to pay for the construction of the Elo Road. So we are working within a degree of financial constraint on this particular site. And for those that have just looked at the layout on the, um, the, the, the screen above, what I would like to remind members is that perhaps the middle quadrant is the most difficult part of the whole of East Leeds extension because the middle quadrant is the most narrowest and it's the bit that's the longest with virtually the fewest houses in it. So without doubt, it's been a challenge. And within that middle quadrant, we've got, in effect, three corridors. We've got a green space corridor. We've got the housing element, which is quite narrow. And then we've got the spine road. And the spine road is something which is significant in its width. The spine road is something in the order of twice the size of a normal housing estate road in terms of its width because of the green space and the tree-lined avenue. We note that there are comments that have been made working with the council with respect to design. And what I would say is that we've made hundreds of design changes to individual dwellings and window sizes and the, the, the orientation of the dwellings. And all of the comments that have been made by the council design team have been welcomed. And hopefully those changes have made, been made to the satisfaction of the council, accepting that there's a few more tweaks to be had. Reference has just been made to the affordable housing mix. Um, Clearly, we've got financial pressures, but that's not to say that's not to say that we can't make changes. Very mindful in conversation is that when we produced four bedroomed affordable dwellings, quite a few of the housing providers are never that keen because they consider them too large. And we're also very mindful is that within the housing schmar document is that the greatest demand is in the two bed dwelling in the affordable requirement. However, it's not to say that we cannot take a look at that element of two, three, two bed and three bed and possibly four. So with the greatest of respect, that's something that we've just had a conversation with for us to take back. Um, space standards is referenced in the report. We think we've now resolved that. So when we come back with an amended schedule, it was on one property type. And I think the, the, the anomalies was no bigger than the table that I'm sat at in terms of space standards. So it wasn't about providing very small dwellings. It was actually um, a, a minor matter that we can now resolve. Open space, it, clearly there's been a discussion about open space and the position of the public open play areas within the report. We're very satisfied now with all of the landscape and the public open space areas, and they are extensive and probably something in three times the amount of green space as to what the policy requirement is. But that's in part due to the linear nature of the site. Parking, there's a lot of work being done about parking, so hopefully members and officers rather are satisfied with the parking elements. And what we've sought to do through the design changes is that whilst we've met the parking standards, we've sought to hide the parking areas such that cars and parked cars are not dominating the street scene. Numbers overall, we started at 297 in these two applications. We're now down at 294. We think we're there or thereabouts, but there are some design tweaks. The southeast corner is that something that we're currently looking at. Access into the apartments is something that we're looking at. Minor changes to the landscaping. The Copenhagen crossings, for anybody that wants to ask us a question about that, we are currently looking at as part of the roads that come off the spine road. We don't see that they're a problem. Um, in terms of the other material that was referenced, We've submitted discharge of conditions, and with respect to the two applications we've got, Chair, there are over 100 conditions to discharge, and one of those, or two of those because it's duplicated, is the bird in the bat boxes, and therefore we don't see that swift boxes as part of the delivery of bird and bat boxes is going to be a problem. So that's it's a condition matter rather than a reserve design matter. Uh, sustainable construction hasn't been mentioned, but again, carrying through some of the principles that whether we, this will again be a no gas scheme um, so in effect we'll be likely working from air source heat pumps and then very finally on the basis that we are coming back to committee although it's always nice not to come back if we don't need to but if we are coming back it's a respect it's a request that we come back no later than august and the reason for that is that the changes that are left are very very minor and that taylor wimpy have got a desire to be on site this year in fact, they've got precious, notwithstanding the, the problems in the housing market and the mortgage availability, but they've got a need to be on site this year and therefore we'd like to, not to be overly delayed, accepting the fact that this committee has got a lot of application in East Leeds Extension to consider, but we'd like to be back on August committee at the latest. Chair, those are our comments and we're open for questions. Thank you for that. Any questions? 
Councillor Hazelwood. Um, hi, yeah, I, I am Councillor Lennox's support exec member for housing, so you would expect me to ask some questions just to declare that before we start. Um, great that you're using SRC pumps, that's brilliant, no gas, I'm, I'm really, really impressed with that. Um, uh, and the space standard is now resolved, which is great. Um, it's I've got a couple of things on the, on the housing mix. Um, so on the housing mix, we've obviously got 45 affordable units out of 294 now. Um, what I'm looking at is obviously, it, unless I've missed something, um, and I've only just come on this plans from South and West, so I might, I might have not seen something in the past. Um, I haven't seen where the houses will be, where the housing mix will be. I've only seen the plans, as in this is the plot kind of thing. Um, what I would want to see is the affordable houses pepper potted in between the other houses. What we don't like is a group, as Councillor um, uh, Paul, uh, Paul, Councillor Graham referred to. You know, we don't like to see a, a, a plot of affordable houses and then other houses over here. So one of my questions is, will they? You know, we, we want to see those pepper potted around. Um, and the and I'm glad to see uh, that you have taken on board the affordable because um, although the report may say that there's a big demand for two beds affordable houses we know from our experience as caseworkers councillors as, as i said that we are we do get a big demand for three bed houses and some of that is alleviated by if we can persuade people to downsize who no longer need the bedrooms but um we do we do need that definitely so that, that i've got another question but that's my first question on, on, on that affordable uh thank you councillor i think in response to the question of pepper potting the answer is yes um what you'll find is that there are several small clusters of affordable all the way up through the site and when i talk about clusters there's a handful of affordables largely close to one another but within a street of, of market dwellings and the reason why they're just clustered slightly is for management reasons in effect so the housing associations like them to be contained together and just to confirm the point that was made by the officer earlier is that there is i think a 60 percent social rented and 40 percent intermediate split on the affordables and that's covered by the section 106. You you've got second question, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. It was on it was on socially rented housing. So you've just you just come on to that because um one thing um one thing that we, we did want to see on this is the social social rented housing um uh, amongst the affordable. So we what because we know that what we need is a mix of the two. Uh, we need rented and affordable to buy. Um, and across the city, we need that. Um, but after speaking to Council Lennox, the, the area that we're looking at particularly needs houses, socially rented houses, as well as the afford, you know, to buy. Um, so, yeah, we, we that, that was my second question about socially rented houses amongst that as well. So I don't know if you, is, is that what you're, you're yes, saying that there will be? Council, yeah, 60% 60, 60 of, of the 45 dwellings is currently proposed of the affordables will be social rented. But I understand that the housing association, in effect, get to control all of them, um, even the intermediate, but yeah, 60%. And then there was a reference made to appearance as well, is that the appearance of this of the affordable dwellings, if it's a two-bed or a three-bed affordable, it will look exactly the same as a two-bed and three-bed market dwelling. Yep, that, that's great. Thank you. That's really good. Great answer. Thank you. Right. Thank you for that. Councillor McKenna. Oh, thanks, Chair. Um, I listened very carefully to your answers from uh, Councillor Hazelwood and clearly does add concerns. I think that concerns most people around the table. Uh, and you seem to answer them really, really well. Uh, we haven't really discussed landscaping, but uh, I think perhaps reinforcement of the landscaping buffer is something also should be considered. I just wonder which your timetable you presented that you'd like to be back here in August, which is really a short turnaround. It could happen, I guess, but it is a short turnaround. But having said that, if all the issues were resolved around the table, would you accept conditions to uh, so we could consider maybe uh, approving it today, Chair? I, I ask officers to consider that. Uh, but, I mean, you, we seem to be pushing out an open door, to be quite honest. So, uh, you know, it seems to me that uh, if we can agree around the table today, then does it have to come back, Chair? I think, Chair, in, in conversation here and listening to the debate about affordable housing in the mix, I think we, we probably think it better that we do come back because it, it's going to be we need a conversation with a housing provider. So rather than take a condition on something as as, as delicate and, and as 
as I say, financially difficult is that where we are with the scheme as a whole, we'd like to come back. As I said, that's not saying we're not making changes, but I think on the point about coming back in August being relatively early, I think, and I'll leave it to officers just to outline, is that we are now dotting I's and crossing T's on the design. And and, and we, we've been at this now for, what, eight, nine months since it was submitted. And the majority, if, if not 99% of the changes sought from the council's design team have been made. In fact, so much so is that this is almost becoming a council officer design scheme as it is much of ourselves. And, and we take that as a teamwork point as much as more as anything. So, you know, we dearly love to be back in August because if we're not, the knock-on effect that it has in terms of getting on site and building those houses and, and, and you know, market and affordable and delivering all the rest of it. And I know there was a point made about landscaping. We haven't gone into the detail on the landscaping, but the landscaping is absolutely extensive and it runs all the way down the Cockbeck Corridor. And to some extent, on the other side of the development, as you've seen in your site visit today, you've got the landscaping corridor of Elaw. So in effect, what we've actually got is actually a very small amount of housing wedged between between two very large landscaping corridors. Right, thank you. Anyone else? Can't... Just very quickly. You, you mentioned the Schma. Is that the city-wide schma you're referring to, or a specific one done for the east of Leeds development? Councillor, it's the city-wide schma, but equally the city-wide schma breaks it down into the 11 sub-areas. So you can actually look into the schma to see what is the need for each of the sub-areas. What you'll find is that there is, without doubt, uh, the greatest demand in affordable dwelling for two-bed. And, and, and you know that that's just there as a figure. But we're not saying that there isn't a great demand for three bed in affordable either, is that there's a great demand for affordable housing right across the city at a very high level. And, and, and we don't need to say to you just how big your affordable housing waiting list is. And it's not getting any smaller. So, as I say, we, we, we'll take that point away on, on, on those elements. Where I'm coming from on that one is that when the Schma was done was years and years ago. And we've moved on in Leeds, for good or for bad, it doesn't matter what you think about it, but it, the, the, the circumstances have changed. And also, knowing you, you will have done a lot of research uh, in terms of figures, because many a time when you and I have crossed swords, you've produced information and you've done your studies. So what is the local study saying about demand now? You've heard what the local ward members are saying. You've heard about what the deputy exec member is effectively saying, or assistant exec member, or whatever title she's got. What's your research telling you the market wants in terms of affordable housing? I think, Councillor, is that our research is still telling us, and I have to say this is why it'd be nice to come back with a little bit of an expert from the housing provider, but our understanding is that it's still largely two-bed, Three bed, quite you know, potentially one bed, but 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 even four bed. But the four beds, we're getting an understanding from the RSLs that they're not particularly keen because of the size and the difficulties with over provision of bedroom numbers when you can't occupy the full amount. There's almost like a, a penalty tax. So it is two bed, but it's also three bed. It's not more three bed than two bed. That's our gen genuine understanding of this. However, we'll take it away. And bring it back and then in the market demand because there's reference in the report about what's the understanding of the market demand is the market demand for family housing remains substantially high and in terms of numbers and i know we presented this case before is that there is a over dominance in the wider supply chain of two bedroom apartments across leeds and we have to get some family housing back into that because currently that's meant to be 25 percent of the supply and it's currently over 60% of the supply. Any other questions? Councillor Hazelwood. I think it, if I can just make a, a comment on Councillor Anderson's, I think that it's the fact that there's 33 two bed and only eight three bed. I think that's where the problem is. So, it, you know, we're not saying there isn't demand for two bed, but I think we need to equal that number out more than it is at the moment is what I think we, we're saying, yeah. I think after hearing from, from yourself and the uh, ward members, uh, and it's good to see, and. You, in fact, you have just said that you've got a really good relationship with the with the uh, officers and also the uh, the ward members have been working with yourself for, for a number of years. And I think if we can find a way, uh, and I absolutely uh, agree with all those who have spoken with regards to the uh, three bedrooms and four bedrooms. I represent Little London City Centre and Hyde Park 
part of the city and there is a high demand in my neck of the wood and i'm sure this this issue is across the city uh, and if you can come up with something the what the ward members are asking for and and you can work together the way you guys have been working together and i think we will be in a in a very very good position all of us so thank you very much uh, for for your time this afternoon can i now ask the members uh, to uh, ask any question to the officers no any comments <laughs> councillor anderson I've got a, a comment specifically about this development. It's just if we would consider something. We on site this morning we talked about the need to try and improve tree lined areas, and we weren't specifically talking about the red line site that the developers are responsible for. We were making reference to the ELOR, and I know that David went away. He got some. Uh, for the research done. Now, whilst acknowledging the research that he's passed on to me, can I ask that officers go away and look and see if any more trees could be planted? We've planted, I think, is it 33,000 or something like that, uh, which is an extensive number. But from where we were standing watching on the bridge, there looked as though there were large mm. bits of grass area and green area that could be utilised for tree planting, and we are aware that some communities are rebelling against tree planting. And if we're wanting to maintain our targets, is there anything more we can do? So basically what I'm saying is, can officers go away and have a look, accepting the quality of the information that David provided to me when I asked the question today? Michael. Yes, that's fine, Councillor. We'll, we'll talk to um, highways and uh, parks and countryside and see what scope there is. Move on to the uh, six questions which are before you, and I'll ask David uh, to go through uh, with those questions, and he'll sum me up at the uh, at the end of the uh, question se se session. Right. Thank you, Chair. So for the first question is, do members have any comments in respect of the layout and the appearance of the dwellings, including the concept of the new different character areas? There is an opportunity here for members to make comments. We've got um, John Stonard, our design officer here. Um, was there, were, were there any comments that members wish to make or are members generally content with what they've seen in terms of an approach? I think the answer to that uh, is yes, we are generally content with mm -hmm. the different character areas and the quality of the housing. Yeah, um, yeah it was just the comment that I made just about the, the pepper potting of the affordable, which I think the, the developer has, has, has kind of taken that board and, and has said, um, you know, that that will be done. But that just just to, you know, to make sure that that's done. Yeah, that was my only concern. Okay, thank you very much. We'll take those away then. So the second question is, are there any comments members wish to make in respect to the housing mix? Uh, and yes, we picked up on those comments about the, that members have made about the housing mix and the balance, and we'll take those away and talk to the developer about that. Um, third question is, are there any comments members would wish to make in respect to the affordable housing provision proposed? And again, we pick up on the pepper potting and on the, the issue of... Uh, the bedroom sizes and the, the housing the housing mix um in terms of question four are members in agreement that all units should meet the minimum uh, internal space standards i think the answer to that is yes but the the applicant has demonstrated that they said they'll amend the scheme so the those are met um do members have any comments in respect to the landscaping proposals uh i think you council mckenna you're essentially saying you just wish to see more information in in that respect so if i understood that correctly yeah uh, but we do have a strategic proposal that's been being put forward and we'll we'll draw that out next time we we'll bring that to to members and question six are there any other matters that relate to the scope of the consideration of these applications that members wish to raise well it's slightly outside of the scope of the consideration but we've noted councillor Anderson's comments and we'll, we'll talk to the respective um, sections of the council to see what can be delivered and bring back information on that to you. I do think it will help in sound attenuation as well. 
the, and it will also affect, help the visual immunity of the people who are living facing towards that, that they won't necessarily see that large fence. Over time, the trees will hopefully mature and they'll get a far better view from their houses. That's where I'm coming from in that. Okay, Chair, I think that covers all the, the comments. Thank you. Yes, David. Um, it's sort of tangential in a way, but um, I get quite a lot of um, views expressed to me about the, the traffic on the e-law and the, the speed of the traffic and the noise of the traffic. So I just wondered whether the trees, more trees would help um, on the spine road, but, but also whether highways could look at that as well. I think it's one of the consequences of um, a new road that seems to be used a lot by joyriders and so on. David? I, yeah, I mean, I'll report that back. I mean, you know, there is a, a speed limit of 50 miles an hour on the Elar Road. Um, and I know that there is some police enforcement out there. Um, but I don't think at the moment it's somewhere that that um, like safety cameras are are proposed at this moment. But that could change with that kind of. And they are monitoring the speed of the traffic, um, you know. So it is something that is on uh, is being monitored. But I think as Councillor Anderson said, and so as as it becomes more used at the moment, you know, as as the East Leeds extension gets built out and there's more traffic on the road, it will become more difficult for that kind of use as a racing track yeah I, I just it was interesting uh some um highways people were putting up some signs where i live for 20 mile an hour speed limit and he lived in skulls and he, he drew it up to my attention that, that the speeding traffic was uh really critical there but also there's going to be a fixed speed camera on the stunningly bypass i think so maybe that could be a consideration for highways to look into sooner rather than later, maybe. That's a good point. Uh, I can't see anyone else. So we'll move on to item eight. Uh, and just for the, uh, for, for the, for the information of uh, public uh, this morning, I wasn't at the site meeting. Uh, as, as many of you are aware that uh, we are celebrating Eid today. So I was in the uh, I was in the mosque uh, at ten o'clock. So I couldn't couldn't make uh, the uh, the site visit. So we'll we'll move on to item eight. Thank you. When you're ready. Thanks, Chair. Apologies, I had quite a few papers to prepare there. Um, so this is a planning application which has been brought to Plans Panel for extensions and alterations to an existing dwelling, uh, including a number of associated works in respect of landscaping, parking areas and an access road. And it follows a request from Councillor Jane Dawson from Chapel Alton Ward, uh, supported by Councillor Al Garthwaite from Headingley and Hyde Park Ward. Apologies, Chair, the, the clicker doesn't seem to be working. Are we okay to move to the next slide? Thank you. So the site is adjacent to uh, Wharfdale Street, which is immediately to the west, um, but is accessed from Ridge Road uh, to the east, uh, the last leg of which is under private ownership. Uh, members who were on the site visit this morning will have seen the road is quite narrow in places as you approach up uh, towards the application site. 
Um, so the wider area, as you can see on the aerial photograph, uh, includes a mix of land uses. Uh, there is industrial, commercial uh, and residential uses all within a stone's throw of the application site. Uh, immediately to the west of the site um, are terrace properties. Um, these are residential properties um, on Wharfdale Avenue and Wharfdale Street. Uh, immediately to the north is a row of, of half terrace properties um, alongside um, a site which was last used as a, a nursery. Um, to the east, uh, we've also got a residential property, which is also served by Ridge Road, the access road. Uh, and immediately to the south is the designated Woodhouse Ridge green space, uh, which is land owned by the council and managed by the council's climate, uh, energy and green space services, uh, which were formerly called Parks and Countryside. So notwithstanding the recent name change, if members are happy, um, mostly through force of habit for myself, I'll continue to refer to them as Parks and Countryside today because the na new name is a little bit of a mouthful. Have the next slide, please. So this is another aerial view of the site. Uh, this is from the south, and you can see the site in context here. So the applicant owns the property. Points are working. Now, unfortunately, I'm devoid of a pointer as well. So the applicant owns the property, which is in the center of this photograph. So it's the white um, rendered property with the, uh, the red roof. Uh, and uh, the applicant and his son uh, are collectors and restorers of classic and vintage cars. So um, you can see lots of cars in this particular area photograph, which was from last year. Uh, and the council is satisfied that this endeavour does qualify as a hobby rather than a commercial operation. Um, we can see um, a large number of cars parked in this photograph and along the access road um, at the moment. And it's clear that this is an activity which we've uh, reviewed and has persisted for some time at the site um, following a review of aerial photographs with evidence of the hobby being, being um, extensing the photographs for around about a 20 year period of time. So the applicant has set out that if planning permission is granted, he only intends uh, moving forward to have a maximum of 12 vehicles on the site at any one time. And those would include vehicles for his own personal use alongside those relating to the, the hobby use. We have the next slide, please. This is a photograph from the south of the site. So we can see the site um, just off center to the right um, at the background, the background of the photo. So this looks over what was up until recently in use as a ch children's nursery. Um, and we can see the canopies of the mature trees in the background beyond the property um, forming the uh, Woodhouse Ridge line. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is a view looking from the alternate view from the north. Um, so we can see here, looking from the top of the Woodhouse Ridge green space, uh, and the site um, is um, hidden in this photograph behind the canopy of trees. Um, so it's fairly well screened, particularly from the north and also from the sides as well. And the next one, please. This is a site, uh, a, a, sorry, a view from uh, Wharfdale Avenue. Uh, so this is to the southeast of the site, um, and the, the existing property is hidden behind these trees and hedging uh, alongside the boundary. Um, it's important to note that these will be retained as part of the, the proposal. Uh, Kevin, next one, please. Uh, so we've got uh, a couple of photographs um, coming up, uh, the first one included of the access road. So um, this is where the, the access road in terms of Ridge Road splits to the um, the Woodhouse Ridge uh, popular walking route. Um, so on the right is the access road to the site, which is Ridge Road. This is adopted highway at this point. And on the left is the walking route up to uh, Woodhouse Ridge. Next one, please. Uh, and this is a little bit further along on the walk this morning. So um, the, the site, uh, for those members on the site visit, was, was cleared in terms of the access road this morning, so we could walk up a little bit more freely. But essentially, the, um, the extent of the council land ends at where the three cones are in this picture. So that is approximately where the uh, highway is um, and ceases being to be adopted. And beyond that point is the private access road, which then goes on to the application property. And we can see the red brick building on the right of this photograph. That is the building which has been uh, most recently used as a children's nursery. Kevin, next one, please. So this is a little bit closer along. So this is the gate to the application property. Um, and beyond it, we can see the house, the white rendered house in the background. 
Uh, there was a question which was raised on the site uh, visits by members this morning in relation to whether the works um, would be undertaken or whether works would be undertaken as part of the wider development to retain um, and put in, retain, in terms of stabilising the sides of the wall which has been recently excavated on the left hand side just behind the digger in this photograph. Uh, and the applicant has confirmed that this will be subject to retaining structures um, and a structural surveyor will be employed uh, which would inform a future building regulation submission for the wider development. So this is the point at which matters would need to be considered through that uh, process through building regulations. Can we move on to the next one, please? Thank you. Um, so this is the red line site plan, which shows the extent of the application site. Um, so we can see this is um, a site which um, is subject to, um, or sorry, outside of the application site to the south is, is what was just subject to the dispute with the council's parks and countryside service, uh, and that is to the south of the site, both to the site south of where the property is at the moment and the access road. Uh, and the layout shows a, a large two-story extension um, to the east of the site um, with alterations to the existing building to the west of that. Uh, we'll have a look at that in a bit more detail in terms of the next plans. But we can also see on here the access road and the provision of a new vehicle passing place to the south um, or the bottom of the road on this picture. Um, and alongside that, we'll have new parking areas and new landscape gardens, um, which would um, convert those parts of the site which aren't um, as such at the moment. Um, and in relation to the new parking areas, um, this plan um, indicates um, there are seven formal spaces, and this is set out in the report in a little bit more detail. But those essentially will be four spaces in the in the garage um, and also three in the outdoor um, parking area. We've subsequently queried with the applicant in terms of the number of vehicles which he would intend to have at the site at any one particular time um, and queried where there may be additional capacity for car parking. Uh, and the applicant has set out that in addition to those seven spaces, um, there would be another three um, spaces possible in the indoor um, workshop area, which is to the rear of the garage. And again, we'll come on to that in terms of the elevation. Uh, and there will be space for further car parking spaces in the land to the front of the house. So in total, um, both formal and informal spaces, um, we consider that there could be accommodation for around 16 parked cars in total, uh, and that would reasonably allow for manoeuvres in the site to um, allow sites to turn around, exit in a, in a forward uh, forward gear. Um, can I the next one, please? So this shows the existing floor plans on the left uh, and on the right, the existing elevations. So we can see it's a relatively modest, um, albeit two-storey property. Um, the ground floor, um, because of the sloping land level, is relatively modest in terms of habitable space. It's the main entrance, and then it goes up to the, the main accommodation at first floor level. And next one, please. Uh, and this is the proposed elevations, uh, front elevation at the top, rear elevation at the bottom, um, show the large two-storey extension, uh, which on the front elevation at the top is on the left, uh, with the parking garage um, at the bottom, extensions above, and then the link to the main house. So changes to the main house include a number of extensions um, to the front and side um, at two-storey, single-storey level, but also um, a change to the roof, including increase in ridge heights and a new dormer window to the front. Uh, and we can see those on the rear elevation, the, the, the backwards facing view of that. Uh, can I have the next one, please? Uh, and these are the side elevations. So the bottom left picture is perhaps the easiest one to see the extent of the new roof um, and the new shape of the new roof. So um, a slightly steeper pitch than we've got at the moment with the dormer in the top left of that particular picture. Um, but the hash markings, which we can just make out on that picture, um, show the extent of the new additions to um, the existing. Uh, can I have the next one, please? Um, so this is the proposed ground floor plan. So um, the large four car garage is at the bottom left of this picture and the workshop is behind that. So although it's annotated as a workshop and gym um, on this photograph, um, the applicant has since confirmed that the gym use would extend to essentially one running machine and perhaps a few weights. So the majority of that space, overwhelming majority will be used for car repair. Uh, and on the uh, right hand side of that picture, we can see that some new habitable space will be created in the existing dwelling. Can you have the next one, please? Uh, and on this one, we've got the first floor plan and also the second floor or the loft plan. Um, so we can see um, it's broadly going to be laid out in terms of the existing house on the right uh, with new accommodation at first and second floor levels, including uh, up to three bedrooms. Uh, and then with the annex for the son of the applicant um, on the left, um, which is showing in there is again a habitable rooms and a three bedroom space, but with also with an outdoor roof terrace to the front or the bottom of, of that particular picture. The next one, please. 
And um, so this is just an aerial photograph of the north. Um, and I wanted at this point to offer an update um, on, on a number of matters, but I'll start with um, representations received. So the officer report sets out that there um, have been objections received from um, former Council Walshaw on behalf of all the Headingley and Hyde Park members, uh, the Woodhouse Rejection Group, and also two further members of the public. Um, it's helpful to clarify here that whilst this is correct, uh, we, we did also receive two letters of general comments from members of the public uh, and issues which are summarised at paragraph 22 of the report um, does actually include these. It's just that we forgot to note that the, there's those two additional general comments in the report. So my apologies in advance for confusion there. Um, and it's also helpful to note that we have subsequently received a further two comments uh, which aren't summarised in the report. Um, the first of these is a note of support uh, for the redrawn boundaries submitted as part of the application. We've had revised plans throughout and that one of those is to clarify the, the red line plans and this, the ownership issues. Uh, and the second is a, a letter which is neutral on the development, but which does express support for those concerns which are raised by other objectors and commentators to date. Um, and those are, um, as I said before, they're listed at paragraph 22 of the officer report. So all those comments uh, were before the council in terms of their substance uh, when we, we drafted the report. So there is a further update I need to um, offer to members in relation to matters uh, in relation to land ownership. Um, can we go back to the site plan um, for this one? Back a few slides. That one yet. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, so it, it's come to light uh, this morning, and I must offer my apologies to members for the lateness of this. And um, that, that it is unclear whether the land required for the passing place, which you can see on the right of this drawing, um, actually falls in land of the ownership of the applicants uh, and not within council land um, under the control of what was Parks and Countryside to the south. So uh, it's been brought to light um, by colleagues uh, in our Parks and Countryside team um, who submitted as essentially a land registry plan to ourselves this morning showing the extent of the council land um, which we own. Um, the plans are at a scale of 1 to 2,500 uh, and at that scale, as you'll appreciate, it's quite difficult to ascertain the precise point at which the council's ownership of the land ends. Uh, essentially, this could be anywhere between, and if we look at the northern edge of the access road on this photograph, the top edge of that, it the, the, the title did show that that could be anywhere between three and five metres from there. So the passing um, place on this particular plan is shown to be a total or require a total width of five metres. So uh, it may be the case that it is in the applicant's ownership or it's not, but that is a matter which we need to explore. So um, it raises a number of issues. Um, first and foremost, uh, it's obviously helpful to come to a consensus view um, between the parties, but also within the council in terms of where the council's ownership ends. Uh, and the initial view from Parks is that they will be happy to ask a, a surveyor uh, to go out and explore this further to exact, assist in answering the question more precisely than we're able to do today. Um, secondly, um, if this does show that the land falls within council ownership, uh, the applicant would need to um, go on to formally serve notice to the council as landowner through the planning process. So that's a standard process that every applicant needs to do where they're not the ownership of land on which the permission is is, is subject of. Um, and that process would unfortunately mean that we would need to observe a further 21 days before we could issue a planning decision um, in relation to that um, for a procedural issue. Um, there is then thirdly a question of whether the passing place could ultimately be delivered. Um, we have spoken to relevant parties this morning, uh, including parks, um, and there are no fundamental objections raised to the delivery of the passing place at this point, even if that were to be a minor encroachment into parks land. Um, however, I must stress that this is only initial view at this point in time, and it would need to be subject to further discussion and negotiation uh, in due course. Um, and of course, the final point Point here is um, as to whether the passing place is essential to make the scheme acceptable in the overall planning balance. So we've had a, a, a consideration of this um, and it's our view that that whilst this is desirable, uh, it's not essential um, in the overall planning balance. Um, we would still have to come to the conclusion um, that we did in the officer report um, and we, we consider that on that basis the scheme would merit a planning approval uh, in the absence of the passing place. Um, and as such, noting that there are clearly a number of matters to, to discuss and resolve, including procedural matters relating to the serving of further notices, what we would recommend is that the appropriate way to deal with this uh, will be to seek to defer and delegate the application to officers for approval of the application uh, with the intention to secure the passing place in the first instance. 
I'll, I'll return to that um, at, at the yeah. end of this um, presentation, um, just to add a little bit more clarity on that. Um, but now we've arrived at this point, um, it's helpful to separate some of the issues which we've attempted to address in the report uh, in terms of relevance to the determination of the planning application. So. Um, if we want to go back to the final slide as well, while we're doing this, that might be helpful. So first of all, in relation to the matter of the plans panel request. Um, so um, the request from Councillor Dowson, um, supported by Councillor Garthwaite, um, that the application should come to panel on the basis of um, the impacts of Woodhouse Ridge is before us. Uh, and central to these concerns um, have been, in terms of discussions with board members in particular, uh, matters relating to an ongoing enforcement investigation by the Council's Parks and Countryside Service. Um, the author report summarises these matters in more detail, but it's been essentially alleged that the applicant has erected unauthorised fencing, um, including enclosure of, of, of council land, um, dumped subsoil uh, and damaged planting. Um, they are matters which are being pursued by the council, um, albeit colleagues in the relevant service have advised that it's only the first of these three matters which they consider as actually occurred on council land. Um, but what it's really important to stress here is that this isn't a relevant consideration um, to the current planning application, um, but rather these are matters which fall outside of the application sites, uh, which are being correctly um, pursued by the council under the appropriate uh, and relevant powers. Um, so they're not therefore matters for the local planning authority to resolve through the current planning application. Um, and we're advising that they're not matters on which plans panel members can give any weight as part of their considerations today. Um, and I, I do expand upon this in the in the report, but essentially uh, the planning case law is clear that this should not be reason to withhold um, or hold up the determination of the planning application. Um, nor should plans panel uh, as a decision making body of the local planning authority be used as a public forum to debate these matters necessarily. Um, this is not to say that we don't have uh, sympathy with the circumstances here, uh, and dare I say, I'm sure that this will raise concerns amongst plans panel members in relation to the bigger picture issues, um, as it does with officers. But we must be clear that our advice, um, as, as we've been clear with local ward members to date, is that these are not matters for, for plans panel, but rather for the relevant council team acting under the appropriate um, relevant powers. Um, I also don't want to be unfair to local ward members here as well, including councillors Dowson and Garthway, as clearly this is a locally significant issue. Uh, and I do have some sympathy with the concern that there is no public avenue for local groups or residents to raise their concerns as part of the parks enforcement process. Um, ward members have also shown an appreciation of, of our position um, as a local planning authority, um, as I've outlined previously. Um, but the plans panel request um, has been put to officers, uh, and it's in light of these discussions um, and it does meet the terms of the delegation scheme for a plans panel determination, hence why we brought it before you today, members. Um, but ultimately, notwithstanding that many of the concerns um, in their origins are, are not planning matters, it's also important to note that this basis um, for the request, um, namely that the proposal will impact on Woodhouse Ridge, green space is certainly a relevant consideration. Um, it is, however, our, our, our argument that the planning officers consider that the proposed development will have a positive impact in this respect. Um, so this rather neatly brings me on, uh, and apologies for the length of this presentation, but um, there are quite a lot of issues to cover, but it rather neatly brings me on to those considerations which are relevant to the consideration of and determination of the application. Um, so clearly, uh, largely a result of, as a result of the applicant's hobby, but also as a result of other more recent works at the site, the site has an unarguably um, or an arguably unkept and untidy appearance. Um, it's important to note here that the applicant's hobby is long-standing and the proposal, uh, if we were to grant planning permission, will not only provide new and improved living accommodation for the applicant and his family, but this will also provide an improved space to carry out this hobby. Um, the new indoor garage and workshop area will help move these activities indoors uh, and no doubt lead to an improvement in terms of noise and disturbance from these activities, uh, which may be heard outside of the site at present. Um, and this does go to the heart of many of the concerns raised by local residents about current activities at the site. Um, the development will also not only retain existing trees and hedging, um, but will add new green landscaped areas at the site. Uh, and this will be a visual amenity benefit and also lead to a wider benefit in terms of biodiversity, alongside being beneficial to wider planning policy functions of the site and its immediate surroundings. Um, so returning then to the panel request from Councillor Dowson, um, it is considered that the proposals here will have an albeit modest um, positive impact on the neighbouring green space and um, through the delivery of landscaping at this particular site as well. Um, they'll also have a, a, an impact on those positive strategic functions I mentioned earlier on, many of which are interrelated. 
including the strategic green infrastructure function of the site, the fact that the site's a great urban green corridor function, and the local nature area function of, of Woodhouse Ridge as well. Um, in addition to this, it's also recognised that um, in granting planning permission, this will likely have a positive knock-on effect uh, in terms of the impacts of some of those ongoing enforcement matters on the neighbouring land, um, principally because uh, if the application is approved with new boundary treatments, which are generally supported, by local ward members and the Woodhouse Rejection Group um, when considered in isolation, um, that that will negate the need for, for, for the unauthorised terrace fencing, which has been um, erected. Um, so it will speed speed, speed in its um, removal, hopefully. Um, and whilst the extensions are um, of significant size and scale over and above the existing house, uh, and that's not in question, um, this is a site which we feel can reasonably comfortably accommodate such developments, uh, and there are no wider design or character concerns with the site being relatively well screened from public viewpoints, as we saw in the photographs earlier. Um, we also noted that the granting of the permission for the garage and workshop should help in terms of noise generating activities. It'll move them indoors, whereas at the moment they've been set and taken outdoors, as we saw on the site visit this morning, should lead to an improvement in that respect. Um, we'll also look to secure a management plan for the site um, to limit noise and other disturbance um, within the planning remit, as it were. Um, now, in response to the concerns raised by the neighbour to the north, at number seven, uh, Wharfdale Avenue, so it's the property closest to the site to the south in this photograph, um, the applicant has also in agreed to install a parking barrier to prevent any vehicles accidentally crashing into the side of the neighbouring properties, which addressing that particular concern. Um, the proposal also achieves appropriate separation distances from neighbouring residential properties and other sites, doesn't lead to any particular remaining concerns. Um, and the creation of parking spaces, both formal and informal, um, we consider sufficient to serve the site, including the applicant's hobby as well. Um, the proposal will also secure the resurfacing of the access road and the permission would ensure by virtue of planning condition that the access road remains free of obstructions, which would be an improvement on the current situation. Um, and the creation of the passing place, uh, which I talked about earlier, would also assist in allowing vehicles to manoeuvre along the access road. However, um, whilst this is desirable, as I mentioned earlier on, we don't consider this as essential. Um, essentially, in coming to this view, uh, we would note that the site, one, has been used um, to serve the applicant's hobby for around about 20 years, probably more, and therefore it's a long-standing use as at, at present at the site. Two, that the access road would only continue to serve a single dwelling, um, and it's not anticipated this would generate a material increase in vehicle movements to and from the site. Um, and essentially, this would generate, um, if that were to be clear, it's kept clear in terms of by use of a condition uh, for obstructions, which we would see to secure anyway, that would address the issue in terms of um, blocking of access movement, et cetera, including for emergen emergency vehicles. Um, so therefore, whilst all parties have shown a willingness at this point in time to secure the passing place, if it could not be secured, um, the overall planning balance would still weigh in favour of granting planning permission. Um, other relevant matters could be controlled by planning condition, uh, including that the site remains as a single planning unit for residential purposes, uh, and we could look to secure delivery of landscaping uh, and a management plan, as I mentioned, for the hobby use, etc. And that could look to things like um, controlling working hours, etc. Um, so, in conclusion, um, officers um, are, in, in light of the new information that's before us, um, still recommending that the application is approved, but ultimately we'll be recommendation, recommending that this is deferred and delegated to officers um, to approve the application, including to seek to secure the passing place in the first instance. Um, if officers are, however, unable to ultimately secure the passing place, uh, we would then seek to approve the application subject to the other conditions as set out in the officer report under delegated powers. Uh, so we will be asking that the application is deferred and delegated on that basis. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Ryan. In accordance with our protocol for public speaking at the plans panel, we have a speaker in objection to the proposal. Uh, Mr. Lees, when you're ready, you've got four minutes uh, to address the panel. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair and panel. Uh, thank you for uh, allowing me the opportunity of um, uh, ad addressing you in relation to this planning application. Uh, my name is Nigel Lees. I'm a qualified horticulturalist and landscape architect. I've been a committee member of Woodhouse Ridge Action Group for 15 years. 
And um, just to tell you a little bit about our group, um, we're a group of volunteers that were established in 1995 to help revitalise Woodhouse Ridge as a safe and attractive public wood, wooded uh, parkland after a period of decline, like many um, environmental groups, we're responding to a period of uh, uh, decline. Um, since then, we've undertaken uh, monthly task days, engage uh, a lot of volunteers and activities on the site and chase funds for environmental improvement projects. In 2022, in March, uh, RAG wrote to planning enforcement uh, inquiring about uh, the erection of 100 metres of uh, Harris fencing, uh, red Harris fencing clad in green, uh, and also raising questions about the activities on the site, um, why there were so many cars, why was it so, uh, what was going on basically. Uh, and we were informed that um, enforcement were looking into the matter. Um, we also wrote to parks and countryside officers uh, and to ward councillors, enclosing photographs, um, plans and boundary plans from the Land Registry Service, because we were convinced that there'd been a significant um, extension or enclosure of land that was public, public park land. Uh, it was apparent uh, that the fencing, which is still in place, unbelievably, uh, was erected to exclude the public uh, from the, that part of the ridge and conceal activity. Correspondence between planning and parks copied to us seemed to be along the lines of parks, you deal with it, it's your land. And then correspondence with Parks copied to us also stated, oh, it's been referred to legal services. This was in March uh, uh, and the summer of 2022. We remain appalled that the planning service took no enforcement action over the summer when excavation and tipping was clearly going on. And it's very visible in the uh, aerial photographs that you looked at earlier what the extent of the tipping. Tipping, in my um, uh, understanding, is is a, a planning is an activity that requires planning permission. Um, the planning service has considerable powers, considerable powers in dealing with such matters, and they have not undertaken them, uh, in in our opinion, uh, in a way that protects public amenity. cannot be right that the applicants, prior to submitting a planning application, opportunistically excavate subsoil from their land to create a reduced level platform for their building. It cannot be right. Uh, and to add uh, insult to injury, the ramp from their land to enable this tipping went through a large patch of Japanese knotweed, which has thus been spread in the area of tipping. And the applicants might believe that uh, uh, they conceal their operation by over sowing it with grass seed, but there is now not a small forest of Japanese knotweed along the whole tipped area. The park service, sorry. Yeah, yeah just finish your comment, sir. Thank you. The park service should not be left with the clear up and remedi remediation of this. And determining determination of the planning application should resolve this matter. And we look to plans panel members to apply its collective head to do the right thing. All right, thank, thank you, Mr. Yeah, any questions to the speaker? Yes, Dave. Um, so what, what do you think the right thing is? Um as far as I understand it, planning should resolve matters um, which have environmental impacts. And, and uh, I do not really understand why the, this planning application shies away from what's happened. Okay. Uh, yes, Councillor Jones. Um, hi, I'm sympathetic to what you're saying. 
This site has been a tip for 20, 30 years. It's a piece of road that I run pretty regular and it's regularly dumped on. It's a tip and it's a mess. And I am convinced, to be absolutely honest, is that the proposal will do anything to resolve any of that. I know that that's strictly not a planning thing, but I am concerned is that we have, I, as someone who's ran that piece many, many times, that it's blocked, pretty regular, there's, it, there's rubbish dumped there. And I happen to think, without being too, how can I put it, crude about it, is that this is one of the, con he has contributed to that over many, many years. I'm also concerned when we're talking about 12 vehicles, is how that's going to be monitored. That was more of a comment. Any other questions? Yes, Councillor. I am totally sympathetic to what you've said, but we have been given clear advice by our planning officer that we cannot take that into. So what more can we say to you to let you to confirm, you know, to let you know that we we are sympathetic, but at the same time, we have been given clear advice and our legal officer did not intervene to say that the planner was doing anything wrong so we've had it implied by the legal officer that the information we were given was correct so what more can we say to you to try and reassure you that we're sympathetic but we can't do anything about it much as some of us would probably like to do something about it i mean what more do you want from me Thank you, Councillor Anderson. Um, uh, I uh, I would ask you to challenge officers on on the on the basis of uh, the fact that we can't resolve parties A, parties B, and parties C. And parties A being planning, parties B being parks and countryside, and parting party C being the applicant. I, I thought it was a matter right. of planning to resolve the, these things. I accept what you're saying, and Ryan, I'm not saying that you're not correct, but would the legal officer like to reiterate the legal view on behalf of the council so that the, so that the residents can see that we are effectively hamstrung in terms of what we're trying to do? So, yes, uh, obviously I've liaised with officers on this matter because it is difficult and we as officers are aware of how members will feel about this and that you are in a difficult position. But it remains, um, and as far as I understand as well, RAG have sort of acknowledged this in correspondence with officers as well, that first of all, some of this area is outside the red line boundary. So that's not what you're looking at today. It's also not part of the development proposal, unfortunately, that you're looking at today. We can only hope that it will have a, a cumulative domino effect that improvement of the development site might have an impact on solving some of the problems. But it does remain to be the fact that, first of all, this isn't really the forum to air views from a residence group that can't be aired elsewhere because it it isn't about this application per se. Um, and in terms of ongoing enforcement or ongoing action that needs to be taken by other council departments, as I say, on an area of land that's outside the red line, that is actually not a matter that a planning committee can unfortunately take into account. Um, ongoing breaches of planning control, first of all, cannot be a material consideration in your judgment of a matter, and also would very not very clearly not be able to be a reason for refusal either. Um, and there is a lot of, of case law in this area that reiterates that to us. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, the planning application has to be considered on its own merits and looked at solely as what is before you, which is this red line boundary, not excluding the parks and countryside area. Although it does seem like it's been a long time since these initial con concerns were raised by RAG, it is just summer 2022, so we're, we're not quite a year on. And as we all know, members and officers, things unfortunately do take time because there are stages that have to be gone through to deal with all residents of the city in an equal way, give time for remediation, 
give time for further investigative work on ter in terms of land ownership. Um, and that is ongoing, but with other officers uh, in, in different departments. Thank you. Can, can I just ask you a question? I mean, uh, very rightly, uh, some colleagues have said that this is not the forum, but you, we do have a local forum, uh, community committees. Uh, now, the two of the ward councillors, I mean, Heading and Hyde Park and Chapel Allerton councillors, there are two different community committees. Have you approached any of those two community committees to raise this particular concern? No, sorry, but we we, ha we haven't been taking it because we been de dealing direct with the two councillors um, in the two wards. But um, if that's a suggestion, then, then yes, we'd be happy to take it up to um, the community councils. The reason I'm saying this is flying tipping is is, is part of the community committee's remit uh, and, and, and it makes life easier. I mean, it used to be on our uh, doorstep before the boundary changed in 2018. So surely, uh, if you raise it within the community committee, perhaps you will have some good questions and, and you know, uh, from, from, from members and officers, uh, they do have meetings on a regular basis uh, and where public can speak for up to 10 minutes or, uh, you know, and ask any questions. And then obviously you will get the feedback on, you know, as, as, as they go along. So it's just a suggestion. I mean, unfortunately, this, not, this is not the forum, but we do have forums within the local authority. If there aren't any other, Councillor uh, Jen, Jenkins and Hazelwood. Sorry. Um, yeah, just to, to ask, have you had any discussion just as a group, the RAG, with Mr. Riley, the uh, applicant? No, we have not. Have you have you tried? Uh, no, no, we haven't. Um, we didn't think it was appropriate, given uh, that council enforcement, we believed, was doing its work. Councillor Hazelwood? Uh, no, I just wanted to say that the 5th of July is the next community committee that would cover that area because I'm we were just further up. So um, that it's the 5th of July at 6pm, Mewa Community Centre. In, in the northwest, yeah. Yeah. Reed? Yeah, sorry. So um, you're saying that council enforcement is doing its work. Well, is the council enforcement doing its work to your satisfaction? Um, no, we haven't. Uh, certainly, council communication isn't doing its work. Um, we reported um, the whole matter and haven't received um, any information recently about what's going on, um, for example, from parks and countryside. Okay, thank you. Shall we now move on to the... Th th thank you very much, Mr. Lees, for, for your time. Uh, As we as we as we don't have any um, uh, anyone in support of this uh, application, so shall we move on to the uh, officers? Any questions to the officers, please? Dave and then Jim. Sorry. Okay. So um, the objector has mentioned things like Japanese knotweed um, being transferred maybe from the, the original site outside of the, the red line area. Um, has this been looked into? Uh, yes, Councillor Jenkins. Um, I, I think first of all, it's just helpful to note that, that these would also be matters which fall outside the scope of planning, but obviously understandably we expected that questions might come forward. So um, we, we have been made aware of, of this as an allegation. Uh, we have spoken to colleagues in park, parks and countryside service um, that they're not aware um, of any evidence being presented to them that this is the case that 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 demonstrably could be the case that the applicant has done this. Um, it forms part of their wider investigation, which is ongoing. Um, we've asked the applicant as well. He stated that as far as he's aware, there's no Japanese knotweed within his particular site. He's disputed the allegations. Um, but yes, it, it, it is ongoing as part of the Parks and Countryside investigation. Um, and I'll just return to the point there that, that obviously I'm, I'm not part of that uh, or privy to that investigation. It's with colleagues in a different part of the council um, and they're not matters relevant to the particular planning application, but hopefully that is useful for information. Councillor McKenna. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
And thank you, Ryan, for that uh, very clear report. Um, I just wonder if the conditions are restrictive enough or controllable enough. Um, I'm looking at uh, Condition 10, Management Plan for Future Hobby Use. You did mention about uh, uh, restricting the car numbers to 16, which is quite a big figure, but uh, if that's the recommendation, okay. But can we put a condition in that that is the limit, the absolute limit on it? Uh, I, I think, obviously, it'd be nice to know a bit more detail about the landscaping here uh, that's been proposed. Um, you recommended that we defer and delegate to officers, which means we might not see that again. So clearly, if you could inform us a bit more. And those of us who was on site realised uh, it's almost a tip, really, isn't it? There's all sorts of being just dumped there. Uh, and I'm not sure if you did say that the uh, the, the lots of rubble and stone that was to one side would be removed. Uh, but there was a lot of more rubbish. There was all the hose pipes and all sorts of uh, uh, things that's been there for many years. And indeed, in the passing area, there was a number of cars which uh, have been there so long that uh, they've grown about two foot of soil under the wheels. And whereas they may have a hobby for a... a for renovating cars, which is commendable, I, I think. It is commendable if you can get uh, vintage cars and get them back into use. You know, that's good. It's a form of recycling. But some of these cars in the parking space had bindweed grown inside them, you know, actually grown inside the cars. And I think they should be removed and scrapped, quite frankly, because I can't see how anybody could renovate them and make them roadworthy and put them back again. So I'd like to see a very strong condition regarding clearing the site. Uh, it does seem to be uh, a big issue for local residents and certainly RAG that uh, things like that has been allowed to happen. And then there's been a complaint uh, about burning on site. Well, given our climate policies now, there shouldn't be any burning on site. And it seems to me a condition there would also uh, be advisable. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Oh, I should say the extension, just to finish, the extension is fine. I mean, at the end of the day, it fits in neat, neatly. There's an issue about digging out, but I'm sure our structural engineers and uh, will make sure that that's all safe. Councillor uh, Sharps. <laughs> Thanks, Chair. Uh, just off the back of what Councillor uh, McKenna said, um, I've wrote those notes down as well. And to add to that, um, the noise uh, nuisance that people complained about, I don't know whether that sits in with the environment team in terms of if there's any work going on, you know, and it's not just a hobby, but um, working outside on the night, you know, the, the noise, if that could be a condition as well. Clearly, we are moving on to the comments now, sir. Yeah. Uh, I would say is fine. I agree with what's been said about the conditions we're trying to put on the applicant, but Leeds City Council are responsible for a lot of the problems we saw this morning whilst going up to the site. The state of the road is nothing sort of diabolical. There were a number of tyres which have been fly-tipped, and I'm told that that's regular. So... I, whilst I agree that we're putting conditions on the applicant, I think Leeds City Council also have a duty towards the applicant that they will keep the area, you know, they will get, get it surfaced properly and that they will keep the area clean from fly tipping. I am aware of the fly tipping there because I was approached uh, a number of years ago to actually meet a journalist down there. Uh, because they were trying to highlight the fact that fly tipping was taking place in that area. Not just in that area, there's a number of offshoots as well where the same problems are occurring. So I do think we need to go back to highways and to street cleansing and say that we're trying to get the applicant to do their part and in return, the council need to do their part because if you those of us who were on site this morning the applicant did mention to us uh, about the fly tipping 
although under normal circumstances we wouldn't necessarily discuss things on a site visit, the fact that it was made, you can't unknow what you know. Yes, sure. Thank you, Chair. We've taken note of what members have been been saying. I, sh I should, in, in terms of the planning conditions, of course, the planning conditions will only bite once they commence the development. So, in in terms of the concerns that exist about the state of the site as it is at the present time, the cars that have have been mentioned and the points that you've just mentioned, Councillor Anderson, they they're sort of separate matters. Um, some of those matters that have been discussed do best fall with parks and countryside to resolve because it's their land. They'll get to a quicker resolution than through the planning powers. Um, they have greater control as, as landowners. But some of the other points that you, you've mentioned, we can take back to our enforcement team and see if there's scope, for example, through untidy land notices, see if we can... If there's harm to immunity, see if we can use those powers to uh, move some of these matters forward. And we'll take a note, Councillor Anderson, about the highways and street cleansing, and we'll we'll pass that information on. Uh, see if we can get those matters addressed as as well. Yes, uh, David. Yeah. So, um, just for the record, I think we probably ought to um, report that. Parks and Countryside is now a different department. I think it's Green Spaces as well, just for the record. Um, the, the other point is that um, I think Condition 1 says there's a standard time limit of three years. So I just wondered how much flexibility there is to, because often three years is a long time, and whether we, we could make it one year to try and make sure that things do happen uh, within, the time, within a time scale. Uh, yes, Councillor. I, I mean, the three-year time limit is the standard time limit, which is encouraged by government in terms of their advice to us as well. I, I, I mean, the only thing I would say with hesitancy, um, not only that that is, will be contrary to perhaps national guidance in terms of relevant matters, is that there clearly are a number of matters which would need to be undertaken at the site to clear the site, et cetera, before development may actually commence in the first instance. So I think... Um, Certainly in discussions with ourselves, the applicant has shown a willingness to to get on and, and develop the site, um, but um, whether he's able to do that in as a timely manner as possible with it not being a, a cleared site to begin with is, is essentially raises an issue there in terms of timing. I mean, I think what I would just say furthermore on that point is that the applicant has been very clear to us that um, they very much wanted to implement their previous planning permission that they gained in, I think it was 2018, um, and are now very much chomping at the bit to, to get going with, with this one. Um, they've expressed um, concerns in terms of the delays to date in terms of granting planning permission, getting to this point. Um, and we've been given the, the impression very much throughout that they're wanting to get on site and, and deliver this as quickly as possible. I, I don't know whether that offers any reassurance, but that's very much the message that's come to us from the from the applicants does any uh, officer wish to clarify anything further no david would you please sum up the uh, reflect of the debate so then we can move on okay thank you chair yes i think um the message that i'm getting is that um in terms of the proposals that are actually before the plans panel and limiting the scope to the considerations of those matters that there aren't any particular objections to the scheme that's uh, that's been pre presented um would like to members would like us to uh, be strict stricter as it were in terms of the nature of the controls which are in, uh, imposed under the condition 10 the management plan and that will cover matters such as number of vehicles hours of operation, nature of act, uh, activities that were carried out in, in the open area, as it were, avoiding stuff like uh, the use of machinery, uh, uh, mechanical tools, sorry, power tools, etc. So we can build that into, into the condition. If members are content on that, then it's for members then to, to move and second recommendation, Chair. Thank you. Based on the summary provided, does this, someone want to move the motion? Could I have a Is it the proposal? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 
can we have a proposal and then a seconder, please? Thank you, Jim. Anyone? Thank, thank you, Nicole. Could we now take the vote on the motion as proposed uh, and second from the proposal and a seconder? All in support? Anyone against? Any abstention thus carried? I all right. The uh, that concludes the business of today's meeting. Thank you for your attendance and contributions. I now declare the meeting to be closed. The date and the time of the next uh, meeting will be twenty seventh of July. Thank you. <laughs>